We now know where Barack Obama's presidential library will be. It was announced earlier today online by his foundation. With a library and a foundation on the south side of Chicago, not only will we be able to encourage and affect change locally, but what we can also do is to attract the world to Chicago. And the location has been narrowed to two sites on Chicago's south side, either Washington Park or Jackson Park. Former White House Senior Advisor David Axelrod joins us now from Chicago. David, thanks for being with us. We know Good that the evening. president was considering several bids for the location of the library, including Hawaii, where he grew up, and Columbia in New York City, where he went uh, for his undergrad. How important was it to him that the library itself ended up in Chicago? I think very important. You know, keep in mind that 31 years ago, Barack Obama, as a young college graduate, uh, came to Chicago to work for a consortium of churches to try and lift south side neighborhoods that were down on their luck. He represented these neighborhoods in the state Senate uh, and as a United States senator. Michelle Obama grew up on the south side of Chicago, and they have deep, deep roots here. And now they're bringing this extraordinary asset back to the south side that's really, that is going to lift these uh, neighborhoods, not just in terms of jobs and economic activity, but as uh, the president suggested, bringing the world to the south side. You know, David, one thing I noticed this morning that was interesting, too, no foreign donations. Why not? Well, uh, he's president of the United States uh, right now, and uh, and that's the decision that the uh, foundation has made that uh, uh, that this would not be. He wants to apply the same standards that he applied to his fundraising uh, when he was running for president uh, while he's in office. But that's not, of course, other uh, presidents have taken us, you know. So you said he's president of the United States now. I mean, do you think they may change that once he's out I'm of office? I'm not suggesting that, and I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I haven't been involved in, in those discussions, but you ask me why has he taken that uh, step, I think, he's, he, you know, he, he, he feels that, that's, that he's uh, the sitting president and that's the appropriate step to take. So it would be what? I mean, do you think it's inappropriate to take foreign donations? Uh, I think that he has set standards that he wants to live by. David, uh, as you know, the president is going to be 55 years old when he leaves office. Uh, with the library now there on the south side of Chicago, does this mean the Obamas themselves will find themselves back in that neighborhood as well? Well, I don't know where they will physically live. I don't know that they've made that decision, but clearly they're going to be spending a lot of time on the south side of Chicago at this presidential center, uh, because the presidential center is going to be more than just uh, an archival reflection on the president's life and, uh, and presidency, but a living, breathing institution that is about the, the mission of engaging people, uh, of uh, confronting problems in the future. Uh, and so it's going to be a very lively place, and clearly he's going to be deeply involved in that. David, while we have you here, let's turn to American politics just for a moment. Hillary Clinton seems to be really in a league of her own. She's dominating her only opponent, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, in the polls. How do you think that's going to go through the primaries here? Do you think she'll keep up that momentum? Well, my, uh, my advice to her and her campaign would be don't inhale. Uh, these poll numbers. Uh, do, you know, behave uh, like you are going after and go after every single vote, uh, because I think it was the presumption of inevitability that was partly why she got tripped up in 2007 uh, and 2008. It wasn't the whole reason, but it was part of the reason. And I think the humility that she brought to her announcement was the right tone. She should go out there and fight as if she's, uh, that she can't count on any vote. Uh, because people want to be asked for their vote. They want you to make a strong case for where you're going to take the country. They don't like inevitable uh, inevitability, and, uh, and she's wise to, to shed that uh, as she campaigns. What do you think it does now that we're seeing Elizabeth Warren, de Blasio, almost kind of trying to push her to the left? I mean, is that a good thing for Clinton? You're, you know, I mean, maybe she's not so inevitable, but what does that mean for her? Well, I think it's important that she stand up for the things that she believes in and that she can, with uh, great authenticity, uh, defend. And I think there is great overlap between some of the things that Bill de Blasio and Elizabeth Warren are talking about and some of the concerns that uh, Hillary has that, and that she's articulated about the state of the middle class in this country, the lack of economic mobility in today's economy. And uh, now she has to come forward with ideas to deal with that. Uh, they may not be exactly the same ideas as Bill de Blasio or Elizabeth Warren's, or, but, but they, they need to be prescriptive to what is the great challenge of our time. 
David, uh, on the Republican side, Jeb Bush is still undeclared, but there are six other Republicans who are officially running. What do you make of the field right now? Who do you think is putting themselves in the best possible position, given how early it is? Yeah, well, I think the, the operative phrase is the last one you used. It is very early. And one thing I've learned, you know, Barack Obama uh, was, uh, you know, not the uh, presumptive nominee at this point in the campaign. Uh, I, I always point out that in uh, 2011, there were six different uh, frontrunners in the national polls for the Republican nomination, including Herman Cain and Donald Trump. So it's really early to determine you know, who really has the edge here. And one thing about presidential campaigns are they're not static, they're dynamic, they're a test. And how people deal with the pressures of a campaign, not just debates, but events that, un, 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 uh, unanticipated events that come up, is uh, really important in terms of, of people's judgment as the, uh, of these candidates' potential can, uh, presidents. I would say the history of the Republican Party is that they nominate center-right Republicans, establishment Republicans. Uh, that's what they've always uh, done, and Jeb Bush uh, sits in that position right now, and I, I think he has to be given a slight edge in these uh, in the early going, but uh, nothing's for certain. You know, but Jeb's getting some static from the right, just like we were talking earlier, Hillary from the left. I mean, is that... You know, how does he deal with that? Well, I think that, that he's wise to take some static from the right. I, he said, and he's right, that you have to risk the nomination in order to win the election. If, for example, he compromised his position on immigration reform, I think that would compromise his greatest strength as a general election candidate, reaching out to the Hispanic community. So he has to uh, resist those temptations. I thought he made a mistake the other day uh, when he said that uh, uh, he would uh, have gone into Iraq as his brother did. It's one thing to say, if I, if I didn't know what I know now, I would do it. But the question is, knowing now would, uh, uh, what you know now, would you still go into Iraq, and, uh, which has been fairly a disaster in many ways but for I mean, us? I mean, David, really, though, when you think about the thousands of lives that were sacrificed, I mean, can he really say, I mean, could any politician say that right now? I mean, without... I don't know. I think I think that most Americans reckon. I think you can honor the sacrifices that our very very brave service people have made, uh, and still acknowledge that it was a faulty policy decision. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't their, any lack of uh, valor or effort on their part. But the policymakers failed uh, in that case, and and there are reverberations that we're still living with uh, today. So uh, I, I think that. One thing people are going to want to know is, have you learned from the mistakes of the past uh, so that we don't repeat them? And if the answer is no, I think that's a demerit as you're seeking the presidency. David, I want to uh, change gears a minute and kind of look back to the weekend when we saw uh, the First Lady deliver I mean, this deeply personal speech um, at Tuskegee and talked about race and her role as the first African-American First Lady. I mean, why do you think... Uh, that she decided to give that speech now? Well, you know, her life, the president's life, is a testament to uh, uh, breaking barriers, dealing with historic uh, barriers. I think she was trying to uh, send a message to these young people that uh, whatever barriers exist, they need to fight through them, that uh, there, you know, there still are uh, barriers, but they can be overcome. And that's an important message on the day when young people are graduating and looking to their future. So I think she, by exposing some of her own experiences, uh, hopes to inspire them to keep going and achieve and strive whatever obstacles are in their way. All right, David Axelrod, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me.